Why do we do this? Because it's important for everybody to share in the fruits of scientific research, scientific thinking, and just wonder at how nature works. And that's why we have a, a large and varied crowd here today. Everybody is excited about this. I am too. So Science Sundays now encompasses of all the science topics in the College of Arts and Sciences, ranging from anthropology and astronomy to mathematics and biochemistry and geography and, and so on. Also, even uh, College of Design contributes, Department of Design contributes. So if you would like to, if you're not already on the Science Sundays mailing list, it's easy to sign up on the web. If you'd like a flyer, they're outside. And then just so you know, after the talk, we'll go upstairs one floor to the traditions room and we'll have the nice reception with the cookies. cookies. <laughs> so uh, I'm representing here uh, physics and astronomy and I'm delighted to welcome my colleague from physics, Professor Nandini Trevetti. She's an expert in solid state physics and atomic physics. Nandini is a prolific author and very highly cited. She's been funded by um, all of the agencies. She has all of the money now. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, science is not just about being um, sitting at a desk or being in a laboratory. It's about sharing it with the public and she's committed to that too. So uh, we're delighted to, oh, one other thing. Nandini was awarded the Ohio State uh, Distinguished Scholar Award in 2019. So she's a scholar. <laughs> a scholar bringing her results here today, and you'll notice something dangerous is gonna happen over there. I don't know what it is, but stay back. Welcome, Nandini. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, John, for that introduction, and to all of you for coming here on this Sunday right after Thanksgiving. I hope you all enjoyed your turkey and you're ready to have some more fun today. Um, I know I'm talking to a very broad audience and maybe some of you hated physics when you were in school, but I hope today to turn that around. Even if one lecture can do it, let's try. So um, I'll talk about superconductivity Super already tells you there's something super exciting that will happen. And I see a number of young people sitting here. So yes, get strapped and sit on the edge of your seats because it truly will be exciting. Um, and you see uh, in the title, Quantum Dance. So you think, you know, what is she talking about? Is she just putting the word quantum in front of just about everything? You see these days, if you want to get your stocks up, you just say quantum blockchain, or you know, like quantum investments, or quantum insights. And that's happening everywhere. It's the new buzzword. But today you will see it actually happening almost before your eyes, right there. If you use a little imagination, it'll come alive. And the story I want to tell is about a fascinating phenomena, but also how it leads to applications. So you see the word levitated trains. And how many of you have heard about quantum computers? Oh my goodness. And they told me it's a public audience. <laughs> this is an expert audience. OK. Well, so that's where I will end with the quantum computer. And what I want you to see is the thread of how you go from something very simple, you can see on a table, all the way to these fanciful ideas to absolutely amazing applications. So that'll be a thread I want to take you through. Um, um, John mentioned money. Well, we rely a lot on uh, people trusting us, and usually it's the NSF and the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, and I do um, want to thank them because they fund individual research, and I really uh, want to make a pitch for that because that's when you have your craziest ideas, and you don't need to convince too many people about it. 
just you and your students. So I also want to thank my students who are in the audience for trusting me and going along with it. And as we get bolder, then we are able to, to convince more of our colleagues and get funding through centers. And there is one such very important center at Ohio State, the Center of Emergent Materials, which has about uh, 20 uh, or more PIs across different departments, not just physics, but including chemistry, material science, engineering, and believe it or not, we are all able to somehow work together. And that will be a theme that you will see, uh, working together as a theme for superconductivity itself. Okay, so let's get started. Oops, this is... Doesn't seem to be changing. OK, now it did. OK. So uh, just to put it in context, it all began 13.7 billion years ago with the Big Bang. And that's really when space and time were created. And so this is a big show, right? And within a fraction of a second, electrons and quarks materialized and they form the first atoms, hydrogen and helium. These combine to make heavier atoms like carbon, and we'll hear about that today, and even heavier ones all the way to iron. After that, even heavier ones were made through uh, neutron star mergers, as have, has been seen by LIGO. And so then we got gold, copper, mercury, and so on. Now, um, all of that, then, you know, where, where, where do we go from there? Gen this generated uh, stars and galaxies, and our solar system is one of those stars with, with its galaxies. And here we are on this Earth today, imagine, talking about new materials, and you'll see new phenomena occurring in these materials. And I will also show you the origin of new ideas and how these ideas spawn technologies. And it doesn't end there. There's a feedback effect. From these technologies, you get even richer ideas, and it kind of goes on. And I hope what you take away from here, especially looking at all these young people, is that this is an ever-enriching cycle, so you can participate in this. It doesn't, it's not like everything has been discovered, very far from that. Even in my own lifetime, we just can't be complacent with that. And that's really the main message for all of the uh, young scientists here. Okay, so who can tell me about a state that does not matter? Yes, but name it. That's right. That's a state that does not matter. Here are some states you know very well. Um, and I was, you know, watching the game very carefully yesterday, lest it went the other way. But, you know, I'm happy to see that we came out victorious. So here are these states of matter you know about, gas, liquid, solid. And the freezing transition happens. We call it TC. The transition temperature is 32 Fahrenheit or zero degrees centigrade. And today what you will learn about is a superconductor which you can add to your lexicon. It's a new state of matter, different from what I showed you, but it is nevertheless a new state of matter. So what is a, what is a superconductor? Okay, the main theme that will emerge or as the word says here, emergence. You'll see that what a superconductor will depict is that it has some constituent parts, and I'll tell you what they are, basically electrons. Um, but the collective behavior of these electrons is very different from what a single electron could achieve or could do. And that is why we call it emergence. 
So here's a very good picture of emergence. It's like teamwork. What each person could do is their own contribution, but when they collectively do something, you can achieve a much bigger or a very different property as all of these people can do with our O-H-I-O resonating. Okay, so the first part is a superconductor is a perfect conductor. Let's see what that really entails. Um, so a conductor, you know, it's what we conjure up. It basically conducts electricity. And we all experience this. Metals are good conductors of electricity. Plastics are insulators. Now, one of the things we do in physics is always connect what is happening on a macro scale with what is happening on a micro scale. So on a macro scale, we can attach a wire to a battery and we can see current flowing. What is happening on a micro scale? So these are atoms. So here's the nucleus, you know, like I was describing to you how they were created. And these are the electrons that, that revolve around these atoms. Now in an insulator, these are individually bound, so obviously no current is able to flow. But in a metal, what happens is this electron can hop from one atom to the other, and this hopping of electrons essentially generates a traveling wave, and that's what allows current to flow. So the motion of a single electron hopping from atom to atom allows a flow of current. OK, next, another property we'd like to understand is how well is current flowing? So the property is called resistance. And it's exactly what you would imagine. You know, you're driving down a highway. How much resistance is there to your, uh, to your path? You know, are people cutting into your, your lane? Or are you able to smoothly flow? That's the property of resistance. So it's a measure of how difficult it is for electrons to flow across a wire when you apply a voltage. And you know, it, you, you can easily imagine it would depend on how long the wire is. Clearly, if you have a long way to go, then there are more chances you'll have some people driving into your lane and causing higher resistance. Also, you can imagine if there are multiple lanes, multiple highways like this, then the resistance will be less because you, know, you could pick one or the other highway or lane. And another aspect of resistance is it depends on the type of material. For example, if you want to make a toaster, right? you want to use a material with high resistance so it heats up. On the other hand, if you want to conduct electricity, you want to use um, a material with very low resistance. So it depends on the kind of material and the usage you have, you want to use it for. Now, this you may or may not ha intuitively realize, but the resistance can also depend on the temperature. So let's try that with this demo. Now, this is always dangerous, doing it. The first thing is always to make sure it's plugged in. <laughs> Otherwise, that itself could be. Now, let's see. Um, so you see there's a little uh, battery with a wire, and this bulb is lighting up those. Maybe if you could dim these lights, you could see that. So um, right there, you can see there's a, the bulb is lighting up, and it's a faint light. And what I'm going to do is here is some magic liquid. Can somebody tell me what that is? How about some of you here? What is that? Yeah, yeah, that's just liquid air, or mostly. Uh, this is liquid nitrogen, but if you take air and cool it, then essentially um, air becomes a liquid, and it's very, very cold. It's bubbling like steam because the room temperature is extremely hot. So what I'm doing now is taking a copper wire and dipping it in this liquid, and you see how it bubbles even more. Now pay attention to the light. You see how bright that got? Yes. So that's 
that's what I wanted to show you, that the resistance of this wire clearly changed when I dipped it in liquid nitrogen. It cooled it. As a result, for the applied voltage, which has not changed, more current was able to flow through the wire. And as a result, it led to a brighter bulb. OK, so the resistance clearly depends on the temperature. Yeah, you can bring the lights on. OK, so a little bit about temperature scales before I start showing you some more um, uh, details. OK, we are used to the Fahrenheit scale. Today, it's a balmy 55 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, centigrade is um, another scale, like with this uh, ice and water. We were looking at that freezing happens at 0 degrees centigrade. And once you go below that, you have to use negative numbers. Now, uh, you, instead of going into negative numbers, we often define another scale, a Kelvin scale, such that zero Kelvin is the lowest temperature, and then everything is referred to with respect to that. So for example, the temperature in this room is about 20 degrees centigrade, which is about 300 Kelvin. So that's something you might want to keep in mind. Room temperature in this Kelvin scale is about 300 Kelvin. And liquid nitrogen that I was telling you is cold is indeed very cold because it is about, you know, like a third of that or fourth of that, 77 Kelvin. Okay, so keep these two temperatures in mind. Now, let's think about the superconductor again. I said it was a perfect conductor. So that would mean it should have zero resistance. Somehow current will flow through that, but it, will, it should have zero resistance. And you might ask, how is that ever possible? Because, you know, every material has some kind of defects. So how is it ever possible that you could get zero resistance in some wire? So let me show you a plot, and we'll go through how to read a plot. So here on the y-axis, I have resistance. Don't you love plots, right? <laughs> I'll try not to use too many equations, but plots are really pictorial, and they give you the essence right away. So resistance and temperature. And what you see here is what the experiment described at two points. At room temperature, the resistance was high. In liquid nitrogen, somewhere here, the resistance was low. And you might want to extend that all the way down to zero and say, well, I can imagine at zero temperature, Kelvin, there should be no resistance. Yeah, possible. But let's look at real systems. So this is a real metal. Its resistance is coming down. But typically what will happen even at zero Kelvin or very low temperatures, the resistance will remain finite because there are always some imperfections and defects and jiggling that, that gives you some kind of resistance to current flow. So this is what happens in a typical metal. OK, now comes 1911. Camerling owns is it's always good to test your ideas in a lab. So he's in his lab um, playing around with, with different elements, different metals. And here is gold. He takes gold. And indeed, at low temperatures, it levels off, giving you a finite resistance. He makes it purer, and it gets to a lower value, which is what you expect. But then here is mercury. He cools mercury, and boom, it drops at a certain temperature. The resistance drops to zero. That's the phenomenon of superconductivity. I'm going to show you a little more about that. But for his discovery, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. So here is the same data shown a little more clearly. These are the data points. And then, rather than what we were expecting, that you would get zero resistance only at some zero Kelvin, what he finds is that at around four Kelvin, the resistance has dropped to zero. Now you might say, what does zero mean? Is it really zero? 
well, you can get a better uh, set of equipment, more sensitive, and that number will keep dropping. So you can get your, you can improve the sensitivity of your equipment, measuring equipment, and the resistivity will keep dropping. So indeed, below a certain temperature that we call a transition temperature, the resistance is zero all the way down. And it's useful to put this temperature in perspective. There's a, yeah. That this is happening in spite. The same impurities and jiggling that was there in the metal is still there. And yet, the resistance has dropped to zero. So something very novel happened when the temperature reached this particular transition temperature. I really have to stand here. Yeah, I wanted to put this in perspective with the temperature of interstellar space. That's around 3 Kelvin. So this temperature is close to that temperature. And this is, of course, you don't need to go to interstellar space. We have ways to reach these temperatures in labs by various cooling methods. OK, so what I want you to take away is this kind of a picture where as you lower the temperature of certain metals, in this case mercury, you attain a state where current can flow with zero resistance. And below this temperature, the system has attained a, a new state of matter, a new uh, kind of organization of the electrons. OK, that's the end of part one. Quick recap, we talked about insulators and metals. We talked about superconductivity, a new state of matter with zero resistance. Good? Ready to take on the next challenge, OK? So what else could they do? Already we can see that this is great. If you could make a transmission line, we have copper, which is, high, which is amongst the best uh, carriers for electricity. It's low loss, but still there's some resistance in the copper wire. But if we could have a superconductor, that current will flow with no dissipation. But there's, there's a catch. It has to be below 4 Kelvin, and that's no good. So of course, we have a couple of challenges. We need new materials which could get us to room temperature, and so on. But let's plow on. Let's see what else are these superconductors good for. OK, so a superconductor also has unusual magnetic properties. So let's, uh, let's look into that. So here was the wire. Instead of making a wire, let's make it into a loop. So now you can start a current in this loop. And if it's usually, if you take a copper wire, after a certain time, the current will, uh, you, the, uh, the wire will heat up, the energy will be dissipated, and the current will come to a standstill, unless you are driving it with a battery. But here, you, once you start it in a superconductor, the current will flow forever. And you may say, what does forever mean? You can put numbers in. And you remember the 13.7 billion years that our universe has been uh, alive? Well, it can go on. You can estimate that the current will not decay for, uh, on the scale of the age of the universe. So that's a long enough time for us. <laughs> OK, now this rotating current loop generates a magnetic field. So um, that's a very important property uh, that tells us that, uh, that now we can have dissipation-less current or a supercurrent which can generate a magnetic field. So th that clearly takes us to the next set of applications of superconductors. These are used to make the most powerful magnets in the world. So for example, um, electromagnets are things you might have played with, right? You take a nail, you wind some copper wire, you connect it to a battery, and lo and behold, this nail can start picking up pins. Um, and that's because the magnetic field that is generated in the electromagnet is attracting pins. So in a similar way, you can make really big magnets using these superconducting coils. And uh, the, 
the Large Hadron Collider, which is a 27 or 30 kilometer big collider in Europe, uh, cutting across different countries, these colliders are used to smash protons and create the same conditions under which the Big Bang happened to see what kinds of, uh, how is this energy converted into different kinds of particles. But for this purpose, you need to put the protons in a circle. You have to bend them into a circle. Otherwise, unless there's a force acting on them, the charges would just move in a straight line. And that bending is done by magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields are created precisely by these superconducting magnets. These magnets are very powerful. Um, so one Tesla is the scale we use. And this is already about 10,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field also arises because iron, the molten iron, rotates. And the rotating iron is like a current generating a tiny magnetic field uh, of the Earth. But the superconducting magnets are much bigger. And the highest magnetic fields we can make in labs today is about uh, 50 to 100, sorry, 50 to 100 Tesla. So those are pretty powerful. And these are made using superconductors. OK, now, this is something many of you may be familiar with, getting MRIs, where uh, they usually use this. You have to go inside one of these uh, uh, machines. And I assure you, the machine is not at very cold temperatures, like this liquid nitrogen. All of that is happening in the casing around it. But around it is a superconducting magnet. And this supercon it's about a three Tesla magnet. And that magnetic field interacts with the proton or the water in the brain. And it can image the brain. So this is an, one of the largest commercial applications of superconductivity at this time. So again, uh, you have to cool the metal to get it into a superconducting state. So if we had a superconductor at higher temperatures, it would be much easier to make portable devices that could get us superconducting MRI machines. OK, now comes another experiment. Let's try this. So this is now, you see how um, uh, once you start seeing the possibilities for uh, applications, how the mind works, OK, from the tabletop, it starts taking us to new things. So here is a magnet on uh, right here. This is a magnetic track. So think of it as a track. And later on, upstairs, you will get to see a bigger, uh, bigger uh, experiment. But here is a magnetic track. And what I have here is this black pellet. So a superconductor doesn't look super like fancy. It's not like diamond shining away. It's just like an ordinary black pellet. The drama is all happening inside. And we will get to what that drama is. So I'm going to take this pellet, and we will cool it back to our liquid nitrogen. And I have to tell you, I'm a theoretical physicist. But I was told not to try my luck and always do things safely. So here I am very safe. And I advise all the uh, young scientists to always follow this with gloves and everything. Um, you know, not to get your fingers like a hard, it'll become like a real, you can try it with banana, but not your fingers, <laughs> is to stick it in that. And uh, you see, everything is crackling because it's all too hot. And I need a little more dexterity. Uh, OK, so we get that in. What I'm doing is I'm cooling that, super, that black pellet. So when it's hot, it's not a superconductor. As I pour liquid on it, it is becoming toward a superconductor. And the foam is there to just keep it nice and moist and cold. OK, I cover it up. There's a little hole in that. You know, we have had a lot of disasters, and we learn from that. There's a little hole so that the pressure doesn't come bursting out. 
And now what I do is I take this pellet and I put it, woo, and I put it on that magnet. Once again, you need dexterity, so for short periods it's okay. But I want you to see and look on the screen if you can, or those who are in the front can look at it. Later on, when you go upstairs, you'll get the joy of holding it and feeling the repulsion. So you see this pellet is actually not sitting on the magnet. Gravity would have pulled it down. But there's something pushing it up, pushing it up so you see how it moves off. Here is gravity, which would have just pushed it down. Instead, it levitates on top of the magnet here. And we have a beautiful demo upstairs, and I'll show it on my screen as well. So let's see, did everyone get a little view of that, imperfect as it was? If you were here, you can really feel the force. The force is with you. <laughs> and it really, you can get a sense of that when you're pushing on it. Those of you who are in the front can vouch for it. OK. So what is really happening? OK, so let's try to get a quick idea of what is happening. Um, here is the magnet with its north and south pole. Here is a superconductor. The superconductor is not magnetic. but what it is to begin with, right? But what it is is when it is cooled, it develops these supercurrents that start flowing inside. And these supercurrents generate a magnetic field of their own, just like we were talking about. And that magnetic field points such that it is north against north. And that is the repulsion that you feel when the superconductor is coming on top of the magnet. What happens if you flip on the magnet? If you flip, OK, great question. I'm so glad you're, you're listening. And so if you flip over the magnet, now it becomes a south here and a north here. And the supercurrent will flow in the other direction to now make a south against south. So no matter which pole you put, the supercurrent flows just so as to bring the same pole against the magnet and always get a repulsive force which levitates the, 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 super, the superconductor. OK, so there it is. <laughs> you see, magically, it's always pushing it. And here is a real demo which you'll get to see upstairs. So you know, why just have something just levitating in one place? Why not make a whole train with that and give it a little push? And now that's what happens. So this is a train that was made by one of the grad students in our department. And you can see that. Uh, the train is the superconductor. It has a superconductor in it. And it's actually a little bit above the track, a few millimeters above. And you see there's no power here. It's just going on its own. Uh, of course, there's air resistance, which ultimately makes it stop. But if we had uh, some control over that, we could make it go even many more rounds. And you'll see that later. OK. So uh, currently, a lot of these magnets are electromagnets. People are trying to make maglevs. But there is a plan in 2027 in Japan. They are trying to make a superconducting magnet. Uh, which will read, reach record temperatures of um, 600 kilometers per hour, which is really very close to what airplanes are able to fly at. So, you know, it's not as simple as you see. Uh, what I've, I'm trying to give you a flavor is, you know, you have a superconductor, you have these ideas in the lab, you can take them further, but at some point, Engineers have to become involved, and then there's also ultimately money and e economics and all of that. So it takes many years and many steps. OK, quick now. Part two, we do a quick recap. Now, talking about superconducting loops, they can sustain a current forever, no dissipation. Superconducting loops generate large magnetic fields that can lead to amazing applications, and we talked about MRI. Um, 
uh, magnetic fields are expelled from inside a superconductor, and that can lead to levitation. OK, so now this is the kind of question um, that, uh, that drives me and my research, is always asking why. OK, we see that in, the, in that pellet, as we saw, or in mercury. That time, the pellet was not there, but mercury-type experiments were there. In 1957, when these three physicists, John Bardeen, Leon Cooper, and Robert Schrieffer, cracked the puzzle. Why does this happen? And they got the Nobel Prize, rightly so, in 72. I would also like to mention that John Bardeen is the only physicist to get two Nobel Prizes. And the first one he got was for inventing the transistor with two other people. Amazing, right? So that itself, he could have sat back and played golf, but there he was trying to now explain superconductivity. I mean, nothing against golf, but... Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, and um, what did they actually crack? What, what did they uh, come up with? So what they did was to show that you, in a metal, you have electrons that people knew. But what they showed was something bizarre happens when you cool the metal. Now, you know, when you study in school, don't ever tell them two electrons attract each other. You'll get a big zero. Because electrons have negative charge, and they repel each other. That's what happens in free space. But inside a material, bizarre things can happen. It's like, you know, two people hate each other. But if you are with other people, there are always intermediaries, and they could get even two warring sides to come together. Right? We see that all the time. Two countries hate each other, and there are intermediary countries. They negotiate, and they can come to some kind of agreement. It's a bit like that. So in a material, there are two kinds of electrons that spin up, the blue ones, and that spin in the opposite direction, the red ones. These two electrons have the same charge, negative charge, but they can start to weakly attract each other and form a pair. So this, is, this was the discovery by these three physicists, that as you cool a metal and you take away all this thermal jiggling, something new starts to develop. Two electrons can start liking each other and forming a pair. And this is the kind you might say, well, how do they come up with this? This is not for you to go into any detail, just to say that the language of physics, and I'm talking a lot today, usually our language is really mathematics and graphs. We like to plot things to give us a visual idea. So these are the kinds of calculations. And you know, at some point, Cooper goes, aha, I see a pair. You know, and that's the kind of stuff that comes out of the calculation. And so that was one step. But it was more than that. It was not just two electrons that formed a pair with opposite spins, but all the electrons joined the same dance. That's why I called it a quantum dance. Because here are the two electrons, blue and red, its partner, blue and red, and so on. But all the electrons, they are not just doing their own random dance. They are all doing the same coherent, uh, synchronized dance. And that's what really a superconductor is. It's a macroscopic number of pairs. And when I say macro, I mean billions and billions of electrons. Imagine, here was current flowing, and that was really the flow of one electron. And that electron was getting scattered by imperfections. But now, billions of them form a coherent state, a coordinated state, and flow together. And now, the same imperfections, which of course don't go away, they are still there in the material, they are not able to scatter those, that big army of coherent electrons that is coming down the path. Do 
across atoms. So the atoms were there. The electrons already were not associated with a given atom. They had already hopped around and become like uh, completely delocalized. De now these individual delocalized electrons undergo a new organization of pairing and coherence. So this is a great idea. You have a Christmas party. You want to kind of bring everyone together. You know, you play your music, really rock and roll, and everybody is, you know, dancing away individually in their worlds. And then temper it down. The temperature is going down. Now they start to pair up, temper it down some more, and now the whole group becomes one uh, unit. So this is a pictorial way of showing. But it's actually even more beautiful than this because it's really this wave function psi that we use to represent it. It's a single wave function of all the electron pairs. And it's all of these billions and billions of electrons that enter a single quantum state. So that's the big story. Awesome, right? Yeah. yeah. OK. You, now, I, let's see, where am I going? Uh, yeah, OK. Now, you might have thought, OK, the, the story is over. So when I was in grad school, this is where the story rested. And our professors, in fact, John Wilkins, who was in our department, he was at Cornell at that time uh, when I was a grad student. He would even say, no point studying superconductivity. We have so they have solved everything. Everything is known about it. And yet, 87, when I graduated, birth of a new paradigm. All of a sudden, everything we had learned was, had to be tossed out of the window because there was a new discovery. So that's where I want to take you next. So never a dull moment. Never think, you know, this is all well known. It's in the textbooks. Challenge everything. Because you have no idea. You might just be asking the right question, and it could open a new door. So I'm going to tell you about two new things. Room temperature superconductors. We are trying to go toward that. We haven't gotten there. And quantum computers. This is where the new research is happening. But I had to tell you the background before coming here. Otherwise, the real awesomeness of uh, this phenomena doesn't come through. And the new part requires new materials. So let's look at those transition temperatures. We saw mercury became superconducting at 4 Kelvin. And over the years, you know, different materials were tried, like lead, niobium. And the temperature went up to about 20 or so Kelvin. Then in 87, there was a big breakthrough. And a new material, YBCO, that black pellet I showed you is precisely this material. It has a, you don't need to know the name. The main point here is that O is for an oxide. So it's an oxide. And C is for copper. Uh, these are physicists, right? They mix up their symbols. I know C is for carbon, but you know how physicists are. <laughs> so suddenly in 87, this class of materials that has copper and oxygen, copper and oxygen with other stuff, there was a big breakthrough, and the transition temperatures went through the roof. Now, room temperature, remember, is 300 Kelvin. So it's somewhere there. But imagine, we have already made a big, big breakthrough of going from 20 to about 140. And the main point was crossing the liquid nitrogen barrier. So uh, physics Woodstock. So 69 was the big music Woodstock. This was reported in the March meeting, which is a big meeting for us in 87. And it was our physics Woodstock with about 10,000 people. Now, that time it was 5,000 people trying to get into one room to hear about this exciting result. Um, the point about breaking the liquid nitrogen barrier was I was able to show you that experiment right here because liquid nitrogen could cool that black YBCO pellet. OK, where next? Um, OK, maybe I'll just show you that data. Look, look how beautiful the data is compared to mercury, which had a few spotty uh, places where the data was taken. Here's a whole host of data showing the resistance coming down. And at 100 Kelvin, boom it goes to zero and remains zero below that. OK, and this is the material. It's a complex material. 
It doesn't grow in the stars. It doesn't grow by merger of neutron stars. It's made artificially in the lab. So there are people with tremendous insights and chemists. That's why we work a lot with chemists because they have insights into how to do this sorcery and wizardry of mixing materials and making this. OK, so now, uh, what is the challenge we face? We, uh, we have, what we are seeing is that the BCS theory very beautifully explained how a metal becomes a superconductor. But we faced a completely new paradigm shift in the discovery of these materials in that these are oxides. They are insulators. They are ceramics. They are the last place you would have gone looking for a superconductor. You know, clearly the word superconductor means you need a conductor. Then there is a hope that it might become a superconductor. This was the last place you would have gone looking because these are ceramics. They don't even conduct electricity. They start out as ceramics. Then you do some tinkering to it, some chemistry tinkering, and they become superconductors with the highest known transition temperatures so far. And this is precisely where my research fits in. Um, what I'm trying to work on, along with other researchers, is to figure out what is the new theoretical framework, what replaces BCS theory, which doesn't work anymore. And initially, the thought is, well, can we squeeze it into that somehow? And you know, at some point, you realize you can't just squeeze it into that old theory. You need to clear the drawing board and start afresh and come up with uh, a completely new paradigm or framework. So that is one of the big areas of research today. And the hope is that through this research, we will get to uh, room temperature superconductivity. We are not there yet, but we have made huge progress. Just to show you that super, the field of superconductivity is a highly decorated field with so many Nobel laureates uh, addressing many different aspects, some of which I discussed today. OK, the excitement still doesn't end. And in 2008, just a year back, a, over, just over a year back, we had, in fact, the second big physics Woodstock. This time, um, in a, in a it's again the same phenomena of an insulator becoming a superconductor. But rather than happening in a complicated material, it happened in carbon, good old carbon. How exciting can carbon be? It's just one element. There we had to put four or five elements together to make something complicated. But here, just good old carbon uh, that is there in your pencil, you can, that's basically graphite. If you take graphite and peel it with scotch tape, you can get a single layer of carbon. This discovery also got a Nobel Prize. So carbon is a hot field today. Single layer of carbon. What these physicists at MIT, led by Pablo Herrero, discovered was if you take two layers of carbon and twist them just by a tiny mismatch, that system can give you the same phenomena of insulator to superconductor kind of transitions. So why are we excited? The transition temperatures are really low. This is not room temperature. But you can get clues to the physics from many different angles. And the point here is, even though the temperatures are low, it's happening in carbon with tremendous tunability. In the previous case, if you wanted to tune the system, you had to make, uh, between the insulator and the superconductor, you had to make different materials. Here, in the same sample, you can use a voltage, and you can tune it from an insulator to a superconductor. So anyway, this I don't want to go into details, but just to give you an overview of how science progresses and how you keep your eyes open for clues coming from different directions. OK, now coming toward the end now, um, let me just say a few. So here was a case where we want to go to room temperatures with new materials. The other thing you can do is take standard materials, aluminum, niobium, things you understand very well, but use them to make 
devices or technologies that don't exist. So that's this direction of trying to make a quantum computer. Now, always travel with what I call a qubit. So that's what I do when I travel. I always have my qubit with me. Here's a qubit. Um, it has a head and a tail. Okay, so it's your regular bit. Now, how do you make it into a qubit? So that's the same thing here. You can have a head and a tail, or you could take those current loops we talked about and have a clockwise and an anti-clockwise loop. That would have been like a head or a tail. So here's a head, here's a tail. But you can also put them in what is called a linear superposition, in a superposition or a mixed state. How do you do that? You take your, your bit and you rotate it. You make it spin. Here's a slightly bigger one. Whoops. So that becomes a qubit. You start spinning these um, heads and tails, and now it is accessing not just two states, but it is accessing a whole host of states in between just the head and the tail. And that's what we call a quantum bit. Uh, a qu oh, sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me? OK. So that's what we call a quantum bit. Uh, it's, it's a linear soup. It's not just this or that. It's this and that with some kind of mixture. And that is the building block of a quantum computer. What we have these days, powerful as they are, I mean, the iPhone right now is more powerful than the computers that were used to land man on moon. That's how much power you have in your iPhone. Um, so why are we trying to go toward a quantum computer? Well, it, it seems there are still tasks like uh, decoding your credit card. Somebody may want to do that. Or like uh, uh, taking a number and factoring it. Uh, so for which classical computers can never do that within the time of the universe. And quantum computers could, in principle, do that. The amazing thing is, from this in principle thought, people have reached a point where today quantum computers exist. And that's what I want to show you. So this is the building block of a quantum computer, a qubit. And recently, the collaboration between uh, Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara, and Google. So you see now how the companies are starting to have faith in scientists at an early stage. They are very happy to join when all the research is done. But now they are starting to join at an earlier stage. And these are the two papers. Again, you see how recent they are. Uh, they have demonstrated uh, the first uh, quantum computer. This is uh, October 23rd, so just a month ago. And what they have managed to do, this group, is make a chip here with 54 qubits uh, made up of these superconducting loops, just like I showed you. Uh, the scale here is about a, uh, two centimeters or so. Um, this was reported in Nature. And the critical point here is this quantum computer with 54 qubits has been able to outperform a classical computer. So the quantum computer can do a specific task. It's not for all tasks. But even on a specific task, to be able to achieve this is awesome. And so it, the quantum computer has taken 200 seconds versus three days on a classical computer. So this is a really big achievement uh, that uh, this group has, uh, has managed to do. And uh, there's a lot more information on this you can get. These are some places for all the young people and any, anybody, I think, given the number of hands that went up, I think you're all accessing this information, Quanta Magazine, TED Talks, and I specifically want to bring up this website that IBM Q has produced where they have a real quantum computer with dilution fridges operating at Yorktown Heights, and you can program that quantum computer and the qubits to do specific tasks, and you can do that remotely from your own computer by logging into this website. So that's where the story ends for today. 
but let me do a last recap. So you all take these few messages and share it with your friends, and it becomes a wonderful point of conversation over Christmas. Uh, so, you know, at least the dance, right? Uh, this emergent state of matter, of electron pairs, and a coherent synchronized dance in the wire. Uh, we saw that the single quantum state flowed with zero resistance. So even if there are impurities, that black pellet is not very pure. I was holding it. There are all kinds of impurities. But when it enters that coherent state, it can flow with zero resistance. Um, the loop generates strong magnetic fields, and uh, the bulk superconductor expels magnetic fields, and that can lead to uh, these levitated trains that you'll see upstairs. Uh, really, for me, this is, the, this is what drives me um, and my research and my enthusiasm for my field of research is this connection between the macro world and the micro world. So, you know, some ordinary looking black pellet could have so much dram drama going on inside um, of, you know, this kind of pairing and coherence. And all of this dance happening to, I mean, there's no one directing the dance. It's not like somebody says, go pair up, go become coherent. But it's the physics principles that drive this beautiful dance. So that is the kind of beauty and wonder I want to leave you with. And for me, really looking at it every day, this is sheer poetry. Thank you. Stand a little bit closer there. OK. Now turn towards me. Oh. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'd like to get a couple pictures to show uh, show what's going on. Okay, uh, that was a fantastic talk. Let's take some questions. Let's dance, and John. <laughs> but we'll do the usual thing. We'll prioritize questions uh, for younger people. So go ahead. Um, my question was: Is about the quantum chip? Would it not take any power to run the quantum chip? You have to. So the question is. The quantum ship, it didn't take any power to run it. That's a very good question. How do you get something for nothing, right? You have to put some energy in to start it. There are, thereafter, that energy that you put in doesn't get lost. So usually, when you try to run a ship, like take your train and you're pushing it on the ground, it stops. And why does it stop? Because it doesn't have any more energy. Yes. And the, where did the energy go? In the friction, right? There's friction on the ground. So what you're doing here is creating a, almost a zero friction situation by having the ship not touch the track. The ship is a little above the track. So it's able to so that you have really reduced the friction. It's still not zero. So in a real situation, you will have to give some power from time to time. There is some friction from the air around it. But you, have, you don't have the grinding friction of solid on solid. Oh, um, I think he mistaken me. What I meant, I asked for the chip, the computer. Oh, the computer chip. Oh. Also a good question. OK, that's also a very good question. That's, um, that's a question about the computer chip has several qubits. And there, that is one of the biggest challenges right now. You want all the qubits to be acting coherently, and they don't. Because from, they're always interacting with the environment, and that upsets the behavior of these chips. So you have to put energy in right now to uh, make them coherent. This is still at an early stage. Ultimately, uh, we will need like billions and billions of chips to be working together coherently. Right now, when you look at your computer, 
the first transistor was a very big object. You have miniaturized it, and you can put like billions of uh, chips on a small area. We are nowhere in that situation with the quantum chips. Yeah, sorry. Sir, go ahead. Yeah, in the Cooper uh, tales, you uh, showed the red one is negative charge. The other one... They are both, they are both negatively charged. So an electron has two attributes, charge and it also has a spin. So red and blue both have negative charge, but one is spinning, let's say, clockwise, and the other is spinning anti-clockwise. So it's the two opposite spinning electrons that bind up. Well, I have something in my mind for so long. How do you characterize negative and the positive charge? What is it? Um, so the way you can characterize that is if you bring, if you have a moving charge, let's say it's moving in a straight line, and you bring it near a magnetic field, it will bend. But if it's a positive charge, it will bend in one direction, and negative charge will bend in the opposite direction. That's how you can separate the two charges. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, uh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think in, in the real world, when you think about energy being transferred to a current in a wire, we always lose some of the heat. Um, what's been described, sounds this, this current goes around and it would go around for the age of the universe, it would go around forever. It sounds like a perpetual motion machine. Is this mm -hmm. not... So we... let me make it more precise. Yeah. Let me make it more precise. So what happens in a superconductor? So you first of all have to be below a certain temperature. And at that lower temperature, you will... So I remember I told you these electrons have formed a pair. So there is some binding energy of the pair. At any temperature, there is some probability of breaking a pair. So that's how at any finite temperature, there is a probability that you will break a pair. Once you break a pair, it will become like any other ordinary electron and it will then dissipate. But you can still find that it is exponentially suppressed because you have to give it energy to break a pair. You can exponentially suppress such processes. So, so it's not breaking a pair. And instead of thinking about single electrons bumping into each other, it's an entire train of electrons? Yes. As one unit? Yes. Yes. It's uh, entire, you got that absolutely right. It's not even a pair, it's the entire train of electrons all moving together. Yeah. Uh, let's see, where... How about you, ma'am? Go ahead. Um, you gave this example of quantum computing to solve the problem for hundred seconds versus regular computing. Can you give us, um, could you describe the kind of task computing? Oh, so not so. This is not sort of an ideal task. This is just a task where they were trying to generate random numbers. But let me give you an example of a task people would like to work toward. Um, so suppose I give you uh, two numbers, five and three. It's very easy to multiply them and say, okay, I get fifteen. But if I give you fifteen as the answer and ask you what two numbers could produce 15, it's still easy because it's a small number. But if it's a large number with many, many digits, say six digits, now you ask what are two numbers it could factorize into, this becomes a, a, what is called, it becomes a very hard problem. So this is where a quantum computer, and you can kind of visualize it, I, uh, that because a quantum computer is accessing many states, it is sampling many ways of factorizing something simultaneously. And that is what leads to the power of a, of a quantum computer. The ability to access many states simultaneously and probabilistically. Okay, let's take one more question. Go ahead, sir, in the back. What happens to the quantum uh, state between protons and neutrons? What are they doing? Are they contributing to the computer? So the repeat the question. Uh, the question is, what are the protons and neutrons doing? Are they contributing to it? Uh, so uh, 
very, very good question. So, you know, I talked about, um, I talked about that weak attraction. So the way that is happening is you get atoms. So the protons and neutrons have formed the nucleus. And they, these, these, the nuclei are sitting in a lattice. So they are literally like this room. Everybody is sitting in their positions. But at the same time, they are jiggling a little bit because of temperature. And these uh, generate certain waves, or like phonons, which are elastic waves. And these elastic waves help in the pairing of electrons. So it's a bit like you can imagine a bed with a little rumple, a little dimple. One of the electrons, and this dimple has been created by the lattice. One of the electrons comes and sits in this dimple and then moves away. And a second electron comes and tries to enjoy the same dimple, producing a little attraction. Yeah, so that's the complicated. Uh, way in which other degrees are also participating. Yeah. Okay. So we're about to go upstairs where we have quantum cookies. <laughs> and you'll that get just to just adds the value. And you'll get to see the levitating train. Let's thank Dandini. <laughs>